I'm going to discuss today The Habit of Light by Gillian Clark. This poem is a celebration of the poet's mother. She builds up a sense of the type of person that her mother was through this very, very strong sense of place. She runs through all of these memories that she has of her mother in her domestic life. We could describe the poem as an elegy, uh, which is a type of poem concerned with someone who's passed away. Elegies are generally quite serious meditative poems, um, like I said, concerned with the theme of death. But here we have a much more positive, lively poem, so it doesn't quite fit into what we would normally expect. It's not sombre at all, it's very much full of light and positive memories. Um, and through that we see that the domestic routine of the mother is celebrated as a kind of sacrament. It's also a sonnet, so it has three quatrains and a couplet, just as a um, traditional Shakespearean sonnet does. But it doesn't quite fit into the traditional sonnet form. So if you look at the rhyme scheme, the use of half rhymes and the line lengths, they don't quite fit into what we would normally expect. And that unique structure reflects the unique and special memories that Clark has of her mother. So let's have a quick look at that rhyme scheme. Um, normally in a Shakespearean sonnet we would have the four quatrains with those alternating rhymes. So we would normally see A, B, A, B, whereas here we've got A, B, B, A. Then it does fit into that C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, and then the final rhyming couplet. But all the way through we have quite a lot of half rhymes. So if you look here we've got lamps and glimpse, flickered and purred, and light and melt. So the, these words rhyme but they don't quite rhyme perfectly. And that creates a sense of uniqueness, um, building up again this idea that the mother was a very unique person. But it could also suggest the difficulty that the poet has had in dealing with the loss of her mother. And then at the end of the poem we do have that final rhyming couplet which is a perfect rhyme and that means that the poem ends on a positive note. So let's have a look at the poem itself. We've got these time references, early evening and dawn, giving a sense that the mother worked hard all day to maintain a pristine house. And that idea of hard work and domestic routine is carried on throughout the entire poem. This phrase, she liked to switch on the lamps, gives it that sense of routine. So it's clearly someone that the speaker was very, very close to. She knows what she used to do every single day. And the past tense there in indicates a memory, so we know that she's looking back on something. And the highly descriptive language throughout this entire passage indicates a cherished house. Many words throughout the poem suggest light, and the objects that are mentioned are also ones which either cast light, like the lamps, um, or they glow or shine, like the brass and the silver and glass. So again, that suggests the fact that the mother looked after her possessions and also that she was very proud of them. At dawn, she'd draw back all the curtains for a glimpse of the cloudlit sea. So that phrase cloudlit creates um, a kind of mysterious, beautiful image. Clouds are something that normally cast darkness, but here they're creating light. So when the mother is around, even clouds have the ability to create light. Her oak floors flickered, so that personal pronoun, her, gives a sense of possession, so she has pride in her home. And the alliteration there on floors flickered creates a magical atmosphere, again suggesting the pride that she takes in looking after her house. As we move on into this next section, we can see um, that the poet has very, very clear memories of her mother, so sight, sound and smells are still extremely vivid. Um, there's also a very strong sense of place throughout the poem. So here we've got the kitchen, the windows, the garden. In that previous section that we looked at, we also had in corners, on low tables, giving a very strong sense of place. We've also got personification here. The saucepans danced their lids, the kettle purred. Again, very positive images, and that brings those memories to life. Supper on its breath and the buttery melts. The alliteration here of breath and buttery reinforces the enjoyment of preparing food. And here again the vivid memory of the garden so she can still hear that sound of the blackbird singing which could be a metaphor for the mother herself singing in the garden. 
And here in this last section, she'd come through the bean rows in tottering shoes. So that phrase, tottering shoes, seems to be um, the poet remembering with fondness, or almost with humour, her mother's inappropriate footwear. Tottering shoes aren't really the type of thing you would generally wear for gardening. Um, she wore a pinny, so that's a type of apron showing that she was self-sufficient, and that idea is reinforced by the huge range of different fruits and vegetables in her garden, the strawberries, the lettuce, the potatoes. The superlative on the palest potatoes and also the alliteration there um, reinforce that pleasure taken in preparing food and the superlative itself suggests that the mother would only choose the very best so she took pride in her cooking. And the fact that the daughter picks out her red hair here, again, it's another aspect of the mother's uniqueness. And that phrase there, her red hair bright, is monosyllabic, um, which places emphasis on each of those words, emphasising the fact that it's a very positive, again, very vivid and vibrant memory. And then we have this final line of the poem, her habit of colour, her habit of light. So we've got that repetition of the word habit. It's a word which is associated with routine, but also clothes, um, it's religious imagery. So it gives us this sense that she creates light and happiness wherever she goes and perhaps has a kind of religious dedication to looking after her house. And also that repetition um, adds emphasis to that word and reflects that, that double meaning that it has.